Welcome to Sacred Stories, a sacred space where the beautiful divine voices of today are shared. I am your host, Reverend Patricia Brooke, and together with the help of our courageous guests, we go on a powerful journey, a sacred journey into our shared consciousness. Today, we are meeting New York Times bestselling author, co-author of the Don't Sweat the Small Stuff book series, world-renowned speaker, and an inspiring light in our world, Christine Carlson. You know, sometimes in life, if you're really lucky, you get to meet a couple people that truly inspire you, that once you meet them, they encourage you just through their beingness, just through how they show up in the world to be a better version of yourself. And for me, one of those people is Christine Carlson. And so I'd like to say I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Christine Carlson to Sacred Stories. Hi, Reverend Patricia Brooks. It's so wonderful to be here with you, and thank you so much for the invite. And what a lovely introduction. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. From the bottom of my heart, the uh, God's honest truth, as they say, I am um, <laughs> without a doubt from the moment from the moment we met, you know, you just <clears throat> I don't know if you meet different people like this also, but you just meet people and they just seem to just kind of shine a little bit brighter. They, they, they just show up in an, in an energy and an integrity in, with a just with a, a, a beauty of spirit. Well, I'd say you're them. one of those people. You do the same thing. So if you saw that in me, it's likely because you have that in yourself, and I could definitely see that in you as well. So, uh, Well, thank you. I I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Listeners, you're in for a great conversation because I'm going to dig in with Christine Carlson because Chris, as, as you have already heard, is a phenomenally accomplished woman, and I we scratched the surface, barely scratched the surface. So I'd like you to tell our listeners, Chris, if you can, who Chris Carlson really is. Wow. When I hear that, I'm like, I get like this little chill that runs up all my legs and my spine because, you know, that's always an interesting thing for you to define, you know, for the public, like who you really are. Um, you know, I would say I am a woman who um, has lived a lot of lives in 53 short years and I say that because um, my life is very segmented into you know before I met my husband my life with my family after I met my husband my life with him and then after his death the life that has transcended that part as well and I feel like I've um, been just really richly blessed very divinely guided through my life um I've had enormous initiations in my life as well, um, as most people have, that my life has been a mixed bag. It's been a tremendous amount of joy, and it's had a tremendous amount of sorrow. And I think all of that has really made me more of who I am and been able to bring that person you know, in, even into the public eye, just to be who I am. Because I think that the greatest thing that I've learned over the years is that it doesn't pay lip service to just say life is really short. Once you've gone through, you know, a very dramatic loss like I have, you know life is short. And it's too short to waste it in, you know, conversations and relationships that aren't real and it's too short um, to not really, you know, embrace who you are in this life because we all are born here with our talents and our gifts and we are really here to shine in our own way. And, and sometimes, you know, there's many of us we have to break through in order, you know, break through a lot of stuff in order to really come out of that. And I think that um, the loss that I went through about 10 years ago really broke. It really heart, It was like heartbreaking and it heart. I wrote a book called Heartbroken Open. I'm not saying that very well, <laughs> but it really opened me to who I really am. I really felt that that um, loss just shattered everything in a way that allowed me to really eventually pick up the pieces and flourish. So I think, you know, I'm, 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 I'm a nana. If you want to talk about defining me, I'm a mother and a nana. Those are my highest priorities are my kids, my family. And then um, I love to share, you know, I love to share my stories, I love to write, I love to 
touch humanity in in as powerful a way as I can while I'm here. That's that's sort of that's my life basically in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> it's um you know it's so fascinating the title of your book Heartbroken Open and so just so everyone understands you're referring to the the loss of your husband Dr. Richard Carlson. So yeah, so years ago. exactly. So 10 years ago, Richard, um, he was promoting his latest book, and he got on a flight to New York, and on that flight, he had a pulmonary embolism, and which took his life instantly. And um, we had no warning, you know, just, it was it was really just a very sudden, um, what I call initiatory loss. It was Really, I, I say it was a great initiation for me. It was one of the first great initiations I've ever had. Um, and I, it was, you know, it was shocking, just beyond shocking. And so it, cat, of course, catapulted me and my daughters, who were 14 and 17 at the time, into tremendous grief. Um, but not too long after, I, I realized, and I, it just popped out in my journal, you know, as I was writing, I was like, oh, my God, I've been heartbroken open to feeling my life and really feeling it with such depth, you know, just feeling everything with such depth. And it was a, a very deep awakening time for me. Um, and, you know, I, I I was shocked because I didn't even know I was asleep. I would have been considered very much a conscious leader, conscious woman at that time in my life, but Nothing broke me into consciousness like this kind of suffering. And I've heard it said that suffering is the greatest mindfulness teacher there is. <laughs> I believe it now. What I find so fascinating about that is that I feel that part of my work is to try to change that paradigm, that suffering brings us to mindfulness because I feel like it finally catches our attention. You know, I feel like most of the time in this world, you get so distracted by life, right, that yeah. we we think we're paying attention, but until we're just, you know, something, and and for most people, you know, the prayer is that it, it, it's not to the extent that you that you have felt it, but it seems to be the the normal way that that most people come into mindfulness and. And I think it's because of that distraction it, that we live in. And I'm, my prayer, my work is that we change that to joy, that the new paradigm into mindfulness can be attained through joy instead of through suffering and pain. Well, I agree with that too. And that's one of the reasons why I share my story so deeply with people and um, around the world is that I, I don't, I don't want people to wait, you know, for their suffering to experience what it means to really be awaken to their life and and um and yet there is there is something that happens to us when we go through a sudden shock like that and it does shock us awake and that's the beauty it's the beauty of the process of healing and it's the gift in the process of healing is that we do get shocked awake and no it doesn't have to be that way ideally we would all choose consciously and yet there's different levels of consciousness and different levels of awakening that, you know, that for me, it just happened that I really ascended into different levels because of the deep level of of loss that I went through. And and it it's a beautiful part of the paradigm. I don't think of it as a negative thing. It's It's a beautiful part of life that we can go through our challenges and during that time, it's incredibly fertile ground for our growth. And in it, in from this point forward, you know, I've definitely chosen to stay awake and to live continuously more conscious in joy. But I will never, you know, I'll, I'll never regret or say that that because I suffered, it was, you know, it, it was a paradigm that needed changing. It didn't. It was a perfect divine plan for my growth and I believe it was a soul contract I had with my husband mm. the the ability to have the courage to have the 
stamina, you know, to have the, 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 the spirit to be able to get out of bed in the morning and continue, you know, after you suffer, suffer such a great loss. What, what got you out of bed in the morning? You know, I just, I remember feeling really early on, like having a conversation with myself and really being able to see my life go into different directions. You know, first of all, what what I love everyone to understand is that I went from being like one of the most envied women in my entire, you know, in the world because I had not only I had such a great relationship with my husband, but we had all of the success that we had, and we had it very early in our lives together. And so I went from being that to basically, you know, hearing my husband had died. And in my mind, you know, my whole life just kind of fell into pieces on at the at, at, at my feet, at the floor. I just felt like my heart was just shattered into a, a gazillion pieces. But one thing really stood out in this conversation that I had with myself, and it was really something that went like this. It was like, Chris, you know, you've been given every single blessing you've asked for your entire life. I mean, my life was like, it almost gave me the illusion that we had control over our lives because everything Richard and I ever set out to do, we accomplished. And I just, I looked at that and I said, my God, you've been given such amazing blessings in your life. How could you, this is the first time, the very first time, I was 43 years old, that I I stood up against something that I couldn't change. I stood up against something that was tragic and yet I was alive and Richard wasn't and that was tragic to me but I couldn't discount all of the life that we had had and all of the amazing experiences that we had had together and here we were this international couple that had written together worked together traveled the world together had two beautiful daughters had an amazing marriage and amazing love, and I just knew that I had to honor our life by being able to step into this process. I knew, and I didn't know how intense the process of grieving was going to be, but I figured it was going to be the it was going to be a rebirth of my life. That's what I figured, and I was not too far off from that. It's <laughs> exactly what it felt like. I felt like a nine month. Um, birthing process. <laughs> uh, Nine well, months of labor. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, you know, and the work continues, I would say, right? The work continues yeah. without a doubt. Let me ask you, though, Chris, because part of what seems to be coming into my consciousness in my spiritual work or on my spiritual journey is the is the service to the collective, is the service to others. And I understand that, that the loss that you suffered and the, and the courage that you have to get out of bed and, and continue the work and honor your life and honor Richard and, and, and being service to others is a personal spiritual growth and journey. But how do you think any part of it or how much of it do you believe could also be clearing for the collective consciousness, clearing pain and trauma and loss for, for others? Well, there is that sense, you know, that, I mean, I, I do, I remember um, feeling really super connected to humanity um, when I was going through grief. And I remember um, sometimes laying on my floor and crying so hard and not being able to breathe and thinking for sure that if I was an older person, my heart would just completely stop because I was, you know, under so much um, stress from just grief in those moments and and then thinking to myself like how does humanity do this without the tools that I have like I had all the tools I had tremendous support from friends and family and I had emotional tools I knew I knew so much about how to go through this process intuitively and how to hopefully come out the other end and I, I think that when we acknowledge our feelings when we go in those shared humanity places where we can suddenly feel the entire world's 
grief in our own heart, I do think that that is the way that we heal the collective. And and we do so because suffering, loss, um, joy, choosing to survive and thrive, all of that changes the nature of who we are and it changes our vibration, if you will. You know, as we become more conscious and we become more awake and we're living consciously, we're living mindfully, we're living very present, you know, our vibration is felt um, at such a huge distance. And then if you if you top it off and you are a blogger or a writer or a speaker and and you're, you know, constantly speaking and and holding that higher level of consciousness and vibration for others, that's, again, how we heal. But if you were an ordinary person and you did nothing more but just allowed yourself to heal, allowed yourself to feel your heart, to, you know, to feel your feelings and move through those and heal, in that way you, you would be healing the planet simply because every human being has a sphere of influence. Every human being has a circle or ten circles of people that they're in contact, and and this is how we raise the consciousness. And you know, even somebody just being in your presence, when you're being a super present listener, um, raises the consciousness of that person. And it's it's how we are as human beings. It's how we interact. It's the energy field that we put out. I mean, that's that's my hit on it, anyways. Does that help? Does that help in the moment? You know, when you when you feel the grief or you're you feel the loss, does it does it help you to know that you are helping others processing it and and moving forward? I mean, I I think it does now. I think when I was going through it, um, it was very personal to me, so um, I I wasn't really thinking in those terms so much at that point. Um, of course, I think now when I feel fear or I feel, um, you know, just something that, you know, is unexplainable and I move through it, yeah, it helps to know that that you're not doing it just for yourself, that you're doing it for the planet. Would you consider this your main sacred story? I think our lives are our co- compilations of sacred stories. Would you say this is your sacred story or is there another sacred story of consciousness, an event that you would like to share or dig a little deeper with us in? Well, I have many, you know, I, I feel like, I feel like sacred story is something I've been really chosen for on many levels, you know, throughout my life. And um, I think I have many sacred stories that I, I would share. I think, um, one of my sacred stories would be when I was a teenage girl and I was um, bulimic and I, you know, had this eating disorder and I I didn't, you know, I felt like when this eating disorder would come over me, it was just, it would control me. And then it was as I began to spiritually um, kind of shift and open spiritually, I'd grown up in a very evangelical Christian home and I I didn't feel like I measured up to that interpretation of um, Christianity. Like I I didn't feel like I measured up, and it was the shame that I was feeling that was really kind of at the root source of what I call separation from spirit. And in that separation from spirit, it created this huge dark hole, this huge gap. And in that gap, I would have all this fear and anxiety, which is where the eating disorder came from, and to fill up that gap. And then as I grew, as I met my husband, and I I grew um, in different ways, and I was exposed to different um, thoughts, and my consciousness awakened, I realized that it was really that lack of connection to spirit which was causing all the angst and anxiety, which was co- which is at the root cause of my eating disorder. And as I healed and as I understood that, I was able to heal and overcome that. And that was sort of one of the, um, I'd say, one of my early super conscious awakenings that happened through healing from my eating disorder. And it also happened after I met Richard. Like, I really believe that his love and his unconditional love 
um, we met, and it was just like that fairy tale, you know, meet, and just at first meeting, fall in love immediately, and then we just stayed in love for our whole lives together. And But it, he was able to love so unconditionally that it taught me how to love myself in that way. And it was through that, you know, that healing and that love that I felt like I was really able to overcome um, you know, a ten year a ten year habit that had grown since I had been like, you know, thirteen years old. So it was it was that was probably one of my first real, you know, sacred story moments, um that really brought me into my spiritual, you know, awakening time. So what would you say is the, the the wisdom gained? You mentioned unconditional love and ability to love yourself, but ten years of, I I would say struggling. I would imagine bulimia would be an, an incredible struggle on many levels. Ten years. What is the wisdom you would share with others that are that are possibly experiencing that? Today? Well, I I would say that um, I know that it's a separation from your spiritual nature that is at the root cause of addiction and it's also be, and, and it causes so much anxiety that you feel like you need to do something to numb out and so I think that as you can um, dive into your your spiritual nature and understand um, find your path you know to God to the universe to divine love however you want to talk about it but to find your path to a greater awakening a deeper life, um, a more committed to yourself to honor your life here on this earth kind of way of life. Um, that would be that would be at the beginning of healing, you know, from any kind of addiction. And then it's a lot of changing your habits. You know, I mean, that's the obvious piece. It's changing. You know, for me, I had to change my relationship to food. I had to change all sorts of things, become super aware um, of what my triggers were. Um, But I had, you know, I have to say, like, I I was really blessed with a very deep level of awareness as a young woman. I I didn't live in the kind of family that could really get me help. And I had an experience where I I was binging so often, and I was a um, cross-country runner, I was binging so often that my electrolytes were so messed up that I actually blacked out um, at the end of a race, but right before, like, the last 100 yards of the race. And I dropped, and I had to get rushed to the hospital. And it was at that point that my my doctors were like, they thought, well, she trains a lot, but what's going on here? Nobody knew I was struggling with an eating disorder except for my very best girlfriend, at the time and and then I realized it. I had been in denial and I realized that oh my god I'm not trying to kill myself with this I just want to be thinner so I can run faster that's what I thought mm. <laughs> so you know I but I do think if you if you are struggling with addiction you have to realize that it is a spiritual disconnect that is the deeper root cause of that um that suffering you know, we started the conversation and you said that you've lived a lot of lives in your life and you feel that your life has been segmented to, to some degree, segments of your life. And I find it fascinating then you also said that you've lived such a fairy tale life and, and, it, and even when you met Richard and, you know, everything was so wonderful. And now you've basically told us from the age of 13 to 23, and I would say prior to 13, there was certainly events or things that happened that brought you to having a eating disorder at 13. So for you to just share with us that you suffered 10 years with an eating disorder, a serious eating disorder, um, and can still look at your life. And now, and then you talked about the lot, you know, the loss of your husband and, 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 but so much joy mixed in, but you can talk about your life and, and the love and the joy and, and be grateful for it. Well, I mean, you know, the thing is, I'm grateful for all of it. You know, I mean, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have attracted Richard um, as a life partner if I hadn't been such an introspective, psychologically like um, aware young woman. Because when I met him, 
I was probably 85% self-healed from my eating disorder. So I had gone through this total self-healing route where I became super aware at a very young age. And so I guess the way I've always been able to look at life and the way I look at my life is that it's like a set of dominoes that you line up in a row and all the dots connect. It's like what Stephen Jobs said that you – you can't connect the dots often when you're in it, but you can always connect connect the dots while looking back. And if you look at life that way, that that you're on this continuum, this continuous journey, you know, and it's a it's a journey of experience. It's a journey of healing. It's a journey of growth. Well, then I I can't like I don't feel ashamed that I struggled or that I went through that. I just did what was in my nature to do, given the circumstances of my life as I grew up, you know, and I did, you know, I I slipped into something because of something else that I had to learn from and learn and grow from. And how could I talk, how could I understand humanity if I hadn't, if I, if I haven't been to all the different, you know, corridors of my own darkness and my own shadow and, and how would I know my light, you know, and I, I really see all that as, is that we all have this journey and this sort of portrait that we're painting with our actions and our choices and our habits every day. And, you know, it's our choice how we paint the picture on a lot of levels. And then it's your choice how you heal. It's It wasn't like I can't say, oh, I chose, you know, I mean, I did choose to have an eating disorder, but it wasn't a conscious choice at that age. You know, if if I chose something like that now, it would be a conscious choice, but I wouldn't choose that because I, you know, I'm past that, you know, so... It's just, um, I think you just have to see, like, your life with a sense of curiosity and also with a sense of wonder, you know, that that you are able, that you're capable of of surviving your greatest losses and returning to joy, you know. And how would you know what joy was if you didn't know what sorrow was? As you're talking, I I just feel such an expansiveness, such an, an allowing for the young women and young men out there to be truly who they truly are. You know, you speak about being an introspective spiritual person uh, as a young person. You speak about struggling with um, an eating disorder. You you speak so openly and honestly and without, as, as it should be, without shame for what you've experienced. And I, and I honor you for that because I believe when, when we can speak, in our speak our truth and be okay with it we allow others to also be okay with who they are and and to to have their journey to their truth also yeah i mean there's there's like hopeless feeling times when you are going through you know coming through um you know an eating disorder or a drug addiction or anything but i mean i just want to say to all people that you know, you just have to get through those times and get and put one foot in front of the other and move forward, you know, to the next moment and to the next moment and to the next moment that someday looking back, if it's your intention to heal, it has to be a very, it has to be an intention. It has to be a super heartfelt, um, deep, driven intention to want to get better, to want to heal but when that's your intention, you know, your mind will find a way to do it. You you will just find a way to do it. And the universe always conspires on your behalf. And the right people will come in, the right friends, the right, you know, I call them angels on earth, you know. I know my husband was one. And, you know, they come in and, and, and they help you. They assist you. And, you know, it's 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 then it becomes easier over time to see that, you know, the the more different things that you've gone through in your life, I think. I mean, um, I would never tell anyone, even my life hasn't been easy. There's been easy aspects to it, but it's not easy. And it's it's not easy to this day, but it's really worth living, and it's really, there's great joy, and there's even more joy now, I mean, than there even ever was before because of where I'm at in my life and because of my deeper understanding. I, I started the show saying that you are an incredible light and that just by knowing you, you know, you inspire me to be a better version of myself. 
And, and I know that everyone listening understands that now um, because of, because of how you live your life, because of the inspiration that you are. I have a question. So you're one of the, the, the most best-selling authors of all time, right? So I, get, I don't even know if that's the correct phrase. You are one of the <laughs> best-selling, right? I'm like, okay. Let me, well, let me certainly, of, certainly of one of the top best-selling, um, you know, top best self-help best. franchises of all times, yes. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you for helping me with that. Um, so tell me, what kind of books do you read? What is your favorite book? I, I find it fascinating when someone is a, is a best-selling author. I want to know what's on their nightstand. Oh my God! Well, I can I can I can read you. I have like 25 books on my nightstand. <laughs> <laughs> I have Living Beautifully by Pema Chodron. I have The Bulletproof Diet by Dave Osprey. I have Before Happiness by Sean Acor. I have um, Second First by Christina Rasmussen. I have Stop Thinking, Start Living by Richard Carlson. I have um, Goldsmith Awakening Mystical Consciousness. I have um, Louise Hay, You Can Fill Your Life. I have Gratitude Works. I have The Philosopher's Notes. And I have Goddesses and Every Woman by Jean Shinoda Bolin. And those are just some of them. The Untethered (laughs) Soul. At the end, Heather sold her too. <laughs> do you do you have an all time favorite? Is it just one? When somebody says, "If you could just read one more book, which one would you?" What pops into your head first? Oh my gosh, um, I don't have an all time favorite book. Quite honestly, I mean, I just love books. I really do. I love, I love all books. Um, yeah, I don't have an all-time favorite. Well, actually, no, that's not true. Okay, so early on when I was um, in college, I really got into Florence Scovel Shin's work, um, The Game of Life and Your Word is Your Wand. And what I loved about her book so much was that for me, she created such an incredible bridge because of my Christian upbringing. And then I was suddenly like, kind of open to the whole new age movement at that time but i it was i was sort of treading um treading water with all of that because of my deep christian upbringing and so that book was like it just it opened my world and opened my possibilities the game of life uh, by florence govelshin so much and helped me become so much more mindful so much more awake to the things I talked about, the things I said, my statements, how my thoughts created my reality, um, all of it, like how I would attract exactly, you know, what I would be thinking. So, I mean, I was, when the when the secret came out, I was like, okay, come on, guys, this is so not new, this is so not the secret. <laughs> like, Florence Gumbel Shin, she wrote about this stuff in the 1920s, you know, I mean, yeah. uh... it's, it's like, so I was like, really not that into the secret because I felt like um, this this was all really, you know, things that other authors had written about for um, many, many, many years and certainly changed my life. I mean, that, that book um, was probably the most pivotal book of my entire life. Well, you know, so the universe conspires, right? The universe brings us together. I find that absolutely fascinating because another woman I greatly admire, her name is Kate Large. She's going to be on Sacred Stories Telefilm at the next season. She has um, she has uh, republished the game of life with with Florence's energy and it's a whole a whole series of stuff. It's actually fascinating. But speaking to Kate and what Kate will be sharing on the Telesummit, I had this conversation with her so uh the other day is that she remembers her past life as Florence's friend and she remembers her death really? in, in that, in that lifetime. Yes. And Kate was like a party girl and she was out where she shouldn't have been, but Florence had just brought her book out and she was talking about the twenties and, you know, women, I don't even, they just had gotten the right to vote. Right. So Florence was, Florence was so ahead of her time and what she oh got in the 1920s. She was. I would have loved to have sat down with her and had coffee. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, well, we could probably we could probably do that. Kate's phenomenal, but Kate Kate will talk about. It. She has real like real remembrances of her wow. life as a as Florence's best friend in the twenties. Wow, so, that's incredible. So it's fascinating that of all the books in the world that have been written, you mentioned that book. I literally yeah. talked to Kate two days ago about this. So. That's amazing. Oh, you'll have to tell her that. That definitely was a pivotal book for me. Uh, and so I will say that those are one of those beautiful messages the universe gives us. Those are one of those when you, you know, when you say the universe conspires, you know, um, when things like that happen, one of all the books and all the bookstores in all the world, you know what I mean, of all the ones yeah. you can mention to me, <laughs> that, that, and that's pretty obscure, I would say, you know, in most circles would be Foreign Spilbushin's work from the 20s, you know. It's, uh, yeah, that's true. That's pretty obscure. Right? <laughs> yeah, I, I find that fascinating. I was going to say mine if you asked me. Uh, so you want to ask me, I'll tell you mine. Yeah, so what's yours? Not, so not anything like that. Um, my, my most favorite book ever, I actually fell in love with this book. I fell in love with the author is Gone with the Wind. I, I opened the first page of Gone with the Wind and I was lost. I was lost in those pages for, oh, I, it was one of those books when you end and you, I, you know, you actually go into a little bit of a depression. Yeah, you you're like, sad. No, it can't exactly. be over. Yeah. So that's mine and and on some level I, I believe a very spiritual book too but but uh totally different but so fascinating so christine carlson this has been such a uh, such an absolute delight and i know that we've again barely scratched the surface of who you are and what you're doing and your life but tell our listeners you know what you're up to now how they could get in touch with you or what would you like people to know yeah, so if you, um, you know, I have several Facebook pages. Um, you can look me up on Facebook, uh, Christine Carlson, K-R-I-S-T-I-N-E, Carlson, C-A-R-L-S-O-N. And also um, go to my website, christinecarlson.com. I have several gifts that you can download on that website um, that are free for you and I do a um, weekly blog and a weekly podcast, and I just launched a program called What Now, which is really a personal growth program designed um, to help people that have come through tra- change and transition to begin to rebuild um, their dreams and to be able to um, rebuild their lives from that point of, of learning who they are after they've been through this tremendous change and this tremendous um process of healing and also for empty nesters for women who are um just they they've been doing you know taking care of their kids all these years and suddenly their kids are are leaving the nest and they just get paralyzed they don't know who they are at this stage of their lives so that's what i'm up to so just go ahead and visit me at www.christinecarlson.com yeah absolutely i encourage everyone to do that and Chris, this has been an absolute pleasure. I have, I have enjoyed talking with you tremendously, and I, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us on Sacred Story. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia. Always wonderful to talk to you. And listeners, thank you for joining us, and remember to tune in each week for Sacred Stories podcast. We have lots of amazing shows and hosts interviewing incredibly conscious individuals like Chris on their shows also. So subscribe to the podcast, like, comment, share, let everyone know the incredible sacred conversations that we're having.